Well, the Detroit Tigers pitching staff continues to impress this spring, but they also get an offensive boost in yesterday's spring training game. We'll talk about that. Uh, we're also going to play your preview, Akil Badu's 2024 season. And then we are going to talk a little bit about the spring breakout games coming this weekend. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team, every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Friday, March 15th, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in. Happy Friday to all. Another week in the books. I hope you all had a fantastic week, and hopefully we'll send you into the weekend here with a nice little show for you, decent at least, I'm hoping for. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about the spring training game, obviously a 7 to nothing victory over the Bronx Bombers, a game in which, again, the pitching staff continues to impress. Uh, but it's good to see the offense score some runs. Spring training or not, uh, this is the Yankees who threw out Stroman, and then the first few relievers out of the pen were all guys that uh, are, are major leaguers or going to be you know, pitching for the Yankees bullpen at some point this year. So good to see the offense kind of show up against some major league pitching there. We'll talk about that. We are also going to talk about Akil Badu do his player preview on the 2024 season. A lot of talking points there. We've been talking about Badu really all winter uh, on what his role on the team is going to be, et cetera. Um, so uh, a lot to go over there. You know, multiple options, minor league options still on his contract. Certainly makes him a really unique case. So uh, we'll talk about him. And then we are going to end the show by uh, not really previewing or anything, just kind of getting excited for uh, the spring breakout games which uh, are starting actually in my reality tonight i'm recording this on thursday afternoon um so uh thursday night is when they start and they go through the weekend so uh the tigers play on saturday we'll talk about that a little bit more like i said at the end of the show let's start off with this ball game here a seven to nothing victory over the new york yankees for your detroit tigers uh casey mize started this ball game and looked really really sharp I'm assuming uh, this was not televised. We don't have tape on it, but his final line was four innings, two hits, no earned runs, two walks, and four strikeouts. That's four base runners in four innings with four strikeouts in four innings and no runs against. Uh, did not give up too much hard contact either. Uh, thankfully, even though this game wasn't televised, we do have uh, some advanced numbers from the game, so we can at least take away something from it. And I think outside of just box score watching, we can take away that the velocity was really, really, really sharp in this ball game through 59 total pitches. Uh, 31 of those were four seam fastballs, which is over 50%, 53%. For all you math whizzes at home, I say that more for me than than any listener. <laughs> um, so uh, 53% four seam fastballs for Mize and it averaged 95.7 miles an hour. Um, that is up two and a half almost miles an hour from the last season of data that we have on Mize, which is fantastic news. It topped out at 97.3. And uh, the fact that if you round to the nearest whole number, that fastball averaged 96 in this one, I think is a beautiful sign. It's not a... a, a, a small amount of fastballs thrown either, right? I mean, four innings, 60 pitches, like I said. Um, so again, we're going to keep stretching him out. And hopefully by opening day, this is uh, uh, he's at a place where the organization and himself, most importantly, in his arm, you know, are trusted to uh, be able to go, you know, five, six innings. Uh, and if we can get that by April, then the rest of the season, we should be all good to go, which is uh, obviously the goal here. So yeah, I, I think that that is easily the biggest takeaway from this outside of just, again, four shutout innings against the Yankees. Uh, the slider averaged 87.2 miles an hour. That is really uh, a high velo for his slider. Historically, that's a 
84 to 85, 85 and a half mile an hour pitch. So we're up a couple of miles an hour there. Uh, the splitter, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't really offer too much of uh, in this game, only through six of them. But those six were up two miles an hour from the last season of data we have as well. So it's been a reoccurring theme with him all spring. Uh, but the reason I continue to bring it up is because his outings are getting longer and longer. And so it, that 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 point stays relevant. Um, I'm holding a pen. I'm not writing anything. It just, I figured, you know, it looks smart. Not trying to be Matt Patricia or anything. Um, but I, that is, because he's throwing more and more pitches and he's slowly getting, you know, stretched out more and more going deeper into ball games. Uh, the fact that the velocity isn't wavering despite the increased workload is a beautiful sign. And, and, uh, you know, outings like this are why I still have him on the opening day roster ahead of Reese Olsen. But now, you know, Reese Olsen will pitch this weekend and look phenomenal. And it, the pendulum's just going to keep going back and forth, I think, really, because they're both really good pitchers and both will pitch for the Detroit Tigers this year, no matter who makes the opening day roster, which is a point that uh, I, I've continued to reiterate and will continue to reiterate because not all five of these guys are going to pitch 180 to 200 innings. Uh, honestly, if a single one of them does that, I'll be pretty impressed because uh, none of them, not a single person, uh, maybe Flaherty did, you know, his uh, Cy Young caliber season, but it's been a while since anybody in this rotation has done that. And most of them have never done it. So uh, good to see there. Uh, the bullpen in this game was obviously really solid as well. Uh, put up a zero. On the scoreboard, uh, Chafin pitched, struck out the side in his one inning. Can't get too much better than that. Shelby Miller with a walk and two strikeouts, no other base runners or runs in his inning. Again, really, really solid. Alex Lang with a walk and no strikeouts. I wish we had tape on that performance. That is, that's um, the walk is, is is rather on brand, I guess. But um, you know, if him not being afraid to pitch to contact more, not even I don't even like saying pitch to contact. We did his player preview, what was that, a week ago, maybe even two weeks ago now, and I kind of explained myself there. I would like him to establish the sinker more uh, and, and not always go for the whiff, and, and I think that that will help him you know, kind of fill the strike zone a little bit more. So I'm hoping that maybe that was what that was, but um, we'll see. Uh, according to, uh, to Baseball Savant, he was still very curveball changeup heavy, uh, similar to last season. So uh, don't have tape on it, but a walk and no strikeouts. Miguel Diaz, one inning, one hit, no runs, two strikeouts. And Andrew Vasquez, one inning, no runs, one walk, one strikeout. So, uh, yeah, really good pitching all around. Uh, Vasquez is a guy that I do think if he stays in the organization after opening day, um, which I, I think he will, but that's, I guess, you know, maybe we'll see. Uh, but if he stays in the organization after opening day, I fully expect him to be up again at some point. I think, uh, Hinch kind of likes him and Fetter as kind of a lefty specialist type of pitcher. Offensively, in this game, Parker Meadows with a couple of hits, uh, Riley Green with a couple of hits, uh, Spencer Torgelson with a walk. But the biggest story offensively was Kerry Carpenter had a very, very good game, had a home run and a double. Goes two for three in this one. Great stuff. Uh, we can kind of move on. I, I, I don't like just reading box scores, um, but when we don't have any video or tape on the game that this that's kind of like all we can do when we're recapping spring games so um there you go uh again pretty pretty obviously solid game seven to nothing win we'll gladly take it i'm not too caught up in in spring win wins and losses like i always say um but Kerry carpenter getting his timing down just because his camp started later than everybody due to the injury or his games rather started later due to the injury uh, good sign there. So uh, would like to see him continue to get a lot of game action. And I think that's pretty much all I have to say on this ball game. Yeah, two thumbs up. Good job. Good work, everybody. Pretty much every uh, department. I guess I don't know how the defense looks, but every uh, you know department of of the team. I I'm assuming we had a pretty good day at the office. So um, let's move on to Akil Badu. Okay, let's. I dropped my pen. I was so smart. I thought I really had it going, and then I just dropped it. Just dropped it again. Okay, we're done with the pen. Let's talk about Akil Badu. We'll do that right after this. Got to talk to you all today about our new friends over at Robinhood. Do you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? 
Robinhood is the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscriptions fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risks, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member SIPC, is a registered broker-dealer. Also got to talk to you all today about our friends over at FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on the big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked On Tigers. Appreciate y'all for tuning in, making us your first listen every day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back on Monday talking about the spring breakout game, which will kind of hype up a little bit here at the end of the show. And, of course, the spring training games. Tigers played three games over the weekend, so we'll cover all of those. Also, as you know, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel locked on sports today and baseball fans mark your calendars because on march 20th at 7 p.m eastern time the best mlb season preview is coming exclusively to locked on sports today on march 20th at 7 p.m eastern be the first to get local insight from the mlb local experts of locked on podcast network again march 20th 7 p.m Eastern time on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app good conversation there for real we have a lot of good hosts here in the al central um let's talk about akil badu okay so uh first just off rip i expect him to start off the season in toledo uh this is something that we started talking about being a possibility i don't know back in december i want to say when we started seeing some of the roster decisions that were being made then really what i maybe even november maybe when mark canna got brought in uh, we kind of looked around uh, on this show and we're like, I don't know if Badu's going to make it through the offseason. And not that he would ever get cut or anything, um, but I thought that there was a real possibility that he was going to get traded because uh, at the end of the day, he didn't hit super well last year. We'll talk about that. And uh, it was a really crowded, not even just crowded outfield in general, but very crowded with lefties specifically. Um, and I thought that, you know, he has a couple of options left. He still has a lot of years of team control, et cetera, et cetera. This was a guy that the organization could really kind of lean into the value play of the peripherals are still pretty solid. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and and because of the team control options, et cetera, that I just mentioned, his value may be uh, at its highest. And now, obviously, if he turns it around and starts hitting uh, similarly to how he did in 2021, then obviously his value is only going to go up from there. But he's got to get playing time to be able to do that. And I think he's going to start off the season in Toledo. Now, same caveat I'll put on uh, this conversation that I did with uh, a lot of the pitchers. And that is that even though he is starting off the season in Toledo, and I would genuinely be surprised if he didn't, I am also would be genuinely surprised if he did not record an at bat for the Tigers this year. He is going to play. Major League Baseball this season. Uh, if there is any injury, missed time, et cetera, in the outfield, Akil Badu is the first call. Uh, I think that he is uh, going to be the first call ahead of Justin Henry Malloy and some others in, again, this rather surprisingly crowded outfield. So 
Uh, I, I want to start off this conversation with, with that, just talking about kind of his standing on the team and, and what I uh, what I expect here early on in the year. Now, as far as his player profile goes, last season in 112 games, had an 11.8% walk rate, a 24.9% K rate, hit 218 with a 310 on base percentage and a 372 slug. That was good enough for a 0.9, so just barely a hair under a one-win season, according to Fangraph's war. Uh, if you're a baseball reference war person, he was 0.6 war. So um, I, I think I want to start off by just the difference between 2021, I, start off, we're five minutes into this conversation, um, the, but I want to talk about the difference between his 2021 season and his 2023 season uh, and, and what kind of the biggest differences and similarities are because in 2021, this dude was a rule five pick that had never played and faced pitching higher than double A, right? Like he was in like high single A for a majority of the year that we took him in the rule five draft and he came up and, and was an above league average hitter. Uh, in 2021, he had a 766 OPS. That's a 108 WRC plus, so 8% better than league average hitter. Uh, was worth almost two WAR, which is a, again a really solid everydayer. Uh, 259 average, 330 OBP, and a 436 slug. 13 homers, 55 RBIs, 18 stolen bases with the old stolen base rules as well. Um, just a, a lot of value here, and that is why. Uh, I think that the Tigers are going to continue to hold on to him and not rush him out the door like maybe I, including a lot of other people, may have thought was going to happen in the winter. Uh, this dude, you know, similar conversation to that we had with Matt Veerling, Akil Badu has a boatload of tools and intangibles uh, that are really hard to, like, teach someone. One of those being speed, uh, 91st percentile in sprint speed. And again, his stolen base number, almost a 20 steal season in 2021. Uh, but in 2023, had a 14 steal season. So a really good base runner has the ability to steal bases and is really, really fast. Defensively, that was one of the shortcomings earlier on in his major league career that he has actually slowly improved on over the last three seasons. And I give him a ton of credit for that um, because that was something that a lot of people really harped on him about in 2021. They were like, you're such a good athlete um, and you have the speed, right? Like it doesn't really make any sense that you struggle as, as much as he was in the beginning of his career defensively. And last year, while he wasn't this big time plus defender, he at least got to a point where he was grading out as a league average defender, a net zero rather, defender as long as he was in the corner outfields and uh they're never going to put him in center uh he's not a center fielder and he's gonna you know the fact that you can put him out in the corners and get net zero defense it does hold value uh the one weakness he has defensively is that he doesn't have a very good arm and that's been documented and talked about a lot obviously in his major league career um but Range, again, much better, much improved defensively, reading balls, et cetera. Um, that paired with the athleticism and the speed gives you a, a pretty fun profile before you even get into the batter's box. Then you do get into the batter's box. And this is where we see, obviously, the biggest discrepancy between 2021 and 2023. Okay, so we're going to talk about those differences and what he can do in 2024, which I'm sure he's well aware of what adjustments he's working on, etc. But we're going to have the conversation about what I want to see out of Badu in 2024 and what he needs to do to kind of look more like 2023 Akil Badu and not as much like 2023. Did I say that right? Look more like 2021 and not as much like 2023 in the batter's box. Okay, we'll do all of that right after this. Got to talk to you all today about our friends over at Fire TV. It's your destination for sports from live, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing television and provides you with access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, 
you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On, first and foremost, and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, MLB right around the corner, obviously, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate y'all for tuning in, as always. Talking about Akil Badu, we talked about a lot of the intangible kind of tools that he has. And uh, one of the, the most enticing things about the player profile of Akil Badu is the speed and power combo. Uh, this is a guy that in 2021 had 13 homers and 18 steals uh, in just 124 games. You prorate that. You're talking about a 15-15 season, and you're flirting with a 2020 season. Now, obviously, proration for stats is a very slippery slope and kind of a dangerous game sometimes, but that is something that uh, that that really, I think, sticks out throughout his entire career. Even last year, he hit 218, right, and was a well below league average hitter, 88 WRC+, plus, still had 11 homers and 14 steals in 112 games. And that leads us to the biggest difference between the 2021 Akil Badu that was setting the world on fire and obviously got off to a really good season, but it wasn't just really good in the first couple of months and then plateaued or struggled. Like he, he was hitting relatively well throughout. Uh, and then the last two years, which has not seen the same success, and that is just the consistency of finding his power. Uh, this past season, he was in the first percentile in sweet spot percentage. Uh, bottom quarter of the league in hard hit rate, bottom quarter of the league almost just outside of in barrel percentage. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. Expected slugging, bottom fifth of the league. Uh, average exit velocity, bottom quarter of the league, right? So you're, you're talking about a, uh, a, a profile here that early on was so reliant on walks with a power threat and then speed. And the last two years, you just haven't got the consistency from the power side of things. The biggest reason for that is a, a, I don't know if it was an adjustment he made or if it was just major league pitching catching up to him. Uh, that's obviously a thing. Hitting at the major league level is really, really, really hard. Hardest thing to do in sports. And so um, maybe it's just that. Maybe it's just pitchers adjusted. The scouting report got out, but his ability to hit fastballs is easily the most notable difference between his 2023 and 2021. Uh, you look at the 2021 season, he hit 266 with a 468 slug against fastballs. 10 of his 13 home runs that season were off of variations of fastballs. 11 of his 20 doubles were off of variations of fastballs. Almost all of his power came from crushing heaters. 2023, not the case. Hit 196 against fastballs and had just six home runs and seven doubles against fastballs as well. His slug was 350. So a huge drop off in that department. Now, the one thing that is, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to say like saving the profile, because again, I, I do think that there's still a major league profile here. Um, but the one of the things that has stood out and been consistent throughout his entire major league career, and I think another one of the reasons why the organization is going to hold on to him is because he draws walks really, really well. Um, he has decently high strikeout numbers and always has because he has kind of a, an uppercut, to, again, power type of swing. Um, but 71st percent percentile, goodness, in chase rate and almost top 15% in the league in walk rate last season, despite all the struggles at the plate, almost walked 12% of the time. That's even the highest uh, walk rate of his career. Uh, he's got a career walk rate over 10 and a half percent. And ever his worst season is 9.8, right? Like he, he draws walks 
really, really well and always has and always will. And that's one of the reasons I have always loved the profile, despite some of the inconsistencies here. Um, but like that is, again, the, the biggest difference is going to be the ability to hit those fastballs. Uh, four seam fastballs last year hit 209 against them. Uh, sinkers, 154. Like, you know, you can go down the list. Pretty much any type of fastball just really struggled against it. Um, and there was a point last year where he just couldn't put the barrel of the ball, uh, the barrel of the bat on the ball, rather. Um, and, and that's obviously some of that is mechanical. Again, he has a power swing, uh, and I'm sure that he's been making adjustments and tweaking it and whatnot over the last couple of years. And I'm sure this spring he's already been doing similar things. Um, but I, I think that just refinding the barrel and getting comfortable putting the barrel on the ball again, like, again, like that's kind of captain obvious. Obviously, if everybody could just put the barrel on the ball every single swing, then they would be the best hitter on the planet. I understand that. But first percentile and sweet, sweet spot percentage, first percentile. In 2021, he was in the 83rd percentile. Okay. Like, this is not just like, oh, like, just find the barrel and, you know, just like I'm talking about anybody. This is a guy who lived on finding the sweet spot of the bat and finding the barrel consistently with every swing. And that's what he did. He hit for power. He drew walks. Never going to be a high batting average guy, I don't think, but didn't need to be to be an above league average hitter as a rookie. And I think that that is probably the biggest thing. Now, again, always going to have a decent amount of strikeouts, probably never going to hit for a really incredible average. Um, but I still believe that in Akil Badu, like I, I, I do, and, and I, I, I just, I root for him like so much. Like he's, he, uh, uh, you know, the story of obviously the rule five and, and people like myself and, and a lot of other people out there going, wow, like that was not really what we expected uh, in the, in the rule five draft and then bursting onto the scene. And just, I, I, there's so many, again, intangibles that come with Akil Badu that if he can re-harness, you know, and even be, uh, he doesn't even need to be a 766 OPS, OPS player ever again. If he can just be a 720 to 740 OPS guy going forward, there's going to be immense value in having him on your roster. Uh, he's going to be a platoon hitter, right? Not a guy that is going to face lefties probably very often for the rest of his career. He's probably going to be close to strictly hitting against righties from here on out, but um, such a valuable asset to have on your team, even if he's not the everyday starter ever again. Having your fourth outfielder be a guy that you're, you're relatively confident in defensively in the corners, uh, can give you speed off the bench, whether it's in the field or on the base paths late in the game, can really hit righties well when he's at his best, right? Pinch hitting opportunities later in the game, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think that there is a very, very valuable asset still in Akil Badu. Um, and I hope that he takes, that will transition us back to kind of a full circle moment, this time in the minor leagues, which he will have to start off the season. He will start off in, in AAA, right? Um, but, you know, take that time and, and just really slowing the game down, whether it's tweaking mechanics or or maybe it's an approach thing. I'm not sure I'm not in those rooms listening to those meetings and, and those breakdowns and whatnot. But um, it, it's going to be all about just refinding the barrel. And uh, and again, hitting fastballs will help that, et cetera, et cetera, as we just did with the breakdown. So I expect him to play Major League Baseball for the Tigers this year. I expect him to be the first call up if any outfielder goes down and misses any amount of time. Akil Badu will be the call, assuming his own health. Um, and uh, he has two minor league options left. Now, one is going to get burned here this season, um, but it's he's in a unique situation where I, I think that's also why they probably didn't really look to go trading him was because if, if – um, is because after, rather, this spring, he still has an option left. You can start him in the minors each of the next two years, and he's still only 25 years old this year. He'll be 26 next season. And, and you can have that depth in the organization. Um, so uh, to, to he, he I think there's still an opportunity here for him to kind of play his way back into a more uh, stable role on the Major League Club because the profile panders to what this organization wants so badly. Um, I, I, I really do still love the fit in this organization. It's just a matter of 
whether he can improve uh, and refine the the swing. That's really what it all comes down to because everything else has has fallen into place. And I think he provides them what this organization wants. It's just, you know, can he get back up to being an around league average hitter uh, like he was a couple of years ago? And if he can, then he's going to get a lot more opportunities. And it might even be the fourth outfielder again at some point. Um, but if he can't, then he's going to be in Toledo the next two years, barring a trade. And uh, he's going to be that, you know, first call away kind of guy that uh, I expect him to be this season. So that's pretty much all I got on Badu. Um, how can you not, you not root for him and love him? I, I really hope that, uh, that he can, he can work on it and tweak um, all of that stuff. Cause there are few players in this organization and, and dare I say in ball, over the last few years that when they are on are more just purely fun to watch than Badu. The Grand Slam last year, obviously the start to 2021, he is an electrifying player. And um, I, yeah, I become a fan favorite here for a really good reason. So um, wishing him the best and uh, hopefully in Toledo, he can work on some of that stuff. Uh, lastly, spring breakout this weekend, not too much to say about it other than I'm really pumped. Uh, I'm, I got to get off air here so I can a go watch the Red Wings, hopefully not lose their seventh game in a row. Uh, but B so that I can, uh, that I can watch Paul Skeens pitch against Jackson holiday. Uh, that's going to be such an awesome weekend event. I think this is so good for the sport. Please support it. Please, please, please. Uh, I, I think that this is something that I hope they bring back every year. I think it's so good for the general public and maybe some more casual fans to get their eyes on and understand the minor league system and get their eyes on some players that are coming through systems and whatnot uh, because baseball has done a horrible job marketing young players and prospects for, I mean, dare I say, like the entirety of its existence. So I think that this is a great step in the right direction. It's an awesome event. Please go watch it. The Tigers play Saturday at 1 p.m. against the Phillies uh, prospect team. So that'll be super cool. Kevin McGonigal removed from the roster, unfortunately. Um, but I think that that's the only change that I've noticed uh, over the last couple of days, however long it's been since they announced the roster, week, week and a half. So really cool event. Check it out. Again, Saturday at 1, Tigers. Um, okay, I think that's it. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. I appreciate all of you greatly. We have almost made it back to opening day. Almost. This will be my third opening day. Third or fourth. I, I, I don't know. Time flies. We'll be back on Monday, baby. Peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all then. Go Tigers.